What is uh, the program that you're going to hear a lot about this evening? So my job is to welcome everybody on behalf of, of, of the partnership and of our Director General and to introduce the flow of the discussions and so on as we go through. So we're so happy to have all of you here. It justifies us being together that we can see one another, share ideas, and what a magnificent place we have to do that in. We are so happy about today and how it's gone so far. So thanks to everybody who's made that happen. So what I'd like to do now is to invite our Director General, Dr. Bruno Oberle, to make some uh, opening marks. Bruno. Thank you. Thank you very much, Trevor. And um, welcome here to you all, in particular to the colleagues from GIZ and from BMU. Um, I share the uh, excitement and the happiness of Trevor to finally, after months of Zooming, being able to jump out of the Zoom room and to, and, and to meet finally people um, three-dimensionally uh, and sharing um, the, and feeling the, the enthusiasm and, and the shared intention of working together. This is great. In this particular case, uh, meeting our partners of GIZ. As you know, GIZ is not only a partner, GIZ is a member of IUCN, like many other members around, uh, and this makes part of the family. This underscores also how important it is to us to uh, always embed and link development and conservation at the same time. And it is great that uh, we have been able to work with GIZ on this uh, panorama program um, for several years and that we, that we will be able to continue working, working on that, even scaling up um, the engagement with the support of the, of the, um, the German Ministry for, for Environment. I'm thanking both GIZ uh, and, uh, and BMU and um, I guess I, I, I hand over to, to, to you, uh, Ingrid. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Oberle. And now I'd like to call upon uh, Mrs. Mrs. Ingrid Gabriela Hofen, who is a member of the GIZ Management Board. Um, Mrs. Hofen. <laughs> oh, you lost. Okay. By the way, there are more partners, but we will be talking about that later. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, I also would like to extend a very warm welcome uh, to you, uh, Bruno, to uh, Mrs. Paulus. And of course, I, think, I hope that Achim Steiner is already online. At least he is going to join us uh, uh, later in, in our debate. And of course, to all colleagues and, and friends um, here in, in the room. And I would like to start, uh, Bruno, with, with really a, a warm congratulations to this excellent Congress. Because when I came in yesterday evening, in the whole morning, what I heard repeatedly, that people are so happy to be here, to reactivate the network, to make it firmer and even um, more actually um, impactful uh, for, for the months to come. And we have a tough agenda ahead of us. And so many thanks to IUCN. It's a great setting. Um, we have exciting meetings, um, and I wish you much success in concluding this, this Congress. Well, this is a family of, so to say, uh, biodiversity friends, and you know that this year is very decisive. Um, not only because the corona pandemic has brought back into our mind how important nature is. And if people come too close to nature, we may have an impact that we don't want to create. But also I think that this Congress is really very timely because we are in the run up to um, uh, the CBD, the Conference of the Parties. And this is a good occasion again uh, to test the waters, to have an informal exchange and perhaps to strengthen our partnership because this is really very much needed. 
And considering the speed and the scale of the extinction of nature, of species, and its impact and the impact of economic activity on nature, um, we all know that we need not incremental steps, but we need transformational change. And this is possibly the word that I heard most throughout the day. And as Achim Scheiner said this morning in, a, in another panel, well, I mean, perhaps it's easy to describe the problem, but the solutions are so complex, it's not that easy to implement them. So when we look at those transformational changes that are required, I think we would in this room actually agree that we have to address the root causes of biodiversity loss. And additionally, we have to do it in a way that actually we do it people-centered, that we are well aware of the contribution that nature actually brings to people's well-being and this is more underlined than in the past because this may be key in convincing the different stakeholders, the private sector, policymakers, decision makers to invest more in the conservation of our environment. So when it comes to transformation, and now I'm bringing the theme back into, into our partnership, um, I think those that have been working on the ground, the practitioners, the experts, you would actually agree that we need to embed more knowledge in institutions and in people. Um, and we hope, therefore, the, that the new framework, the new biodiversity framework, recognizes this need and gives special emphasis to the management of knowledge and also to the facilitation of learning. Proven concepts, new ideas, good practices, innovative solutions, I think they can make really a difference. Uh, and we need this type of difference desperately to turn the needle into the right direction. Panorama, our partnership, actually, Solutions for a Healthy Planet is such a fascinating global platform and network that provides exactly the kind of solutions to address not only biodiversity conservation, but other global threats such as climate change adaptation mitigation and actually um, the environmental issues and this at the same time. Let me express a very sincere thanks uh, to the Ministry of Environment. I cut the name a bit short, Ms. Paulus, <laughs> you allow me to do so. Because you have provided actually the support, the political support and the financing so that IUCN and GRZ could work together to actually to let Panorama grow and to make this partnership even, even bigger. Um, we have seen that Panorama, Panorama has grown over time. And now as we speak, we can already count with more than almost 1,000 solutions embedded in the platform. Um, and we have covered those solutions have come from more than 180 countries. This is uh, amazing, isn't it? And additionally, when you look to those that have provided solutions, we can count with the support of more than almost 700 different institutions, people, experts, and they have provided actually concrete examples, concrete proposals, how we can actually better deal with biodiversity protection and conservation. And I think what is unique in Panorama, just to give one feature, and you're going to learn more about Panorama later on um, in this event, is that it actually spells out the factors or so-called building blocks that have contributed to successful applications in biodiversity con conservation. And then, of course, when such an factor, an application is being provided, for instance, from Cote d'Ivoire, then it can be taken on by other people because this is really an evidence-based capacity development option. And it can be, those building blocks can be applied across geographies and sectors. So Panorama wouldn't be Panorama without the strong partnership. So I would like to express my sincere thanks to all the many institutions that form part of it. And some of them are actually laid out here down. You can't see it right now, but they were here on the screen at the very beginning of this event. And I would like to say really a sincere and deep thank you to all those partners, because without you, 
actually Panorama wouldn't have had such a success and wouldn't have had the chance to grow. Of course, what is unique in the platform is that you can bring your comparable advantages, your capabilities, um, your uniqueness, and you can actually bring in your thematic focus as well. So Panorama is a framework, has specific rules, but it provides a lot of flexibility uh, to, to absorb your knowledge and your experience um, and in a way that can be applied then in other countries. Um, we both, we are going to now actually go to a signing, signet, a signing ceremony and this is an indicator that IUCN and GIZ with the support of the German ministry that we are here for the longer term. We know this type of change requires patience, strong partnerships, and the signing ceremony should underline that we would like to develop Panorama even more into a strategic um, option for the future. And we are happy uh, to join you, uh, Bruno, in this effort and the Ministry for Environment. And I hope that all the other partners, that you stay with us in this joint effort for the longer term. I think it's worthwhile to do it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Hoffen. And, and now I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Oberle and, and Mrs. Hoffen to come across here to this uh, elegant signing table. <laughs> um, but it gives full visibility to everybody, to the cameraman, and what a great occasion. Oh, you don't need to. No. No, 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 you can take it off for the signing. <laughs> and the photographs. So maybe you can, all oh, right, yeah, hand over. <laughs> right, thank you so much. Yeah, we can do more. So it is now my great pleasure to invite the administrator of the United Nations Development Program, Akim Steiner, to join us online, and I'm hoping the technicians have that well set up. Uh, Akim, um, here we go, great. <laughs> We've, we dragged Akim out of bed early this right morning. Right here, I hope you can hear me, Trevor. Can you please ask Mike Wong to get off the call? Uh, he's uh, taking up half the screen, I don't know. How do I do that? Uh, just announced it so that he can. Mike, could you leave the call, Mike Wong, uh, because it's uh, on the screen. Go ahead, please, uh, Mr. Steiner. Trevor, there is a slight delay in uh, your voice, but also I can't hear you right now. Are you asking me to start? Yes, please. Okay. So, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to join you. And whenever I hear the introduction administrator, I remember that I was once Director General. And seeing all of you there, Bruno, Trevor, Ingrid, and others, um, it is my great pleasure to join you on the occasion of, of the IUCN World Conservation Congress and also for this event, um, Panorama, because as Bruno and Ingrid have already said, it's one of those examples of um, forward-looking partnerships. And um, inevitably in this moment in time and um, also at a World Conservation Congress, we will hear a great deal about what is going wrong with the world. And um, that is as it should be. But actually... As um, Kada Asma, who was once my boss when I had the honor of leading the Secretary of the World Commission on Dam, said when he was Minister of Water Affairs and Forestry, he said, look, I have all these people coming and telling me what my problems are. I know my problems. Tell me about the solutions. So from that vantage point, I want to celebrate Panorama and also the partnership with GIZ, with IUCN and so many others, as you have said, 
and also celebrate the continued support of the German government and the Ministry for Environment, Nature, Conservation, and Nuclear Safety. Let me just say that in the context of where we find ourselves, Panorama is something that I think speaks to particularly those who are at the front line of trying to make a difference. The 700 solution providers that include NGOs, academics, government institutions, um, organizations such as UNDP and GIZ, I think have all, in a sense, brought together a platform and a network that allows us to put more support behind those people who are trying to figure it out how to do it every day. And the Panorama Solutions for a Healthy Planet, I think, has already gained a constituency simply because it is able to connect people and particularly connect those who are trying to make things work, even if conditions are, as they often are in our world, suboptimal. And um, since UNDP joined originally in 2013, um, we then also returned, as I understand, in 2018 uh, on the board and as part of being the coordinator of the Protected Areas Thematic Community and joined the launch with IUCN, the Pathfinder Award that you will hear a little bit more about in a moment from my colleague Midori Paxton. So let me just say that um, today is, uh, in one sense, first of all, my pleasure to join you, a sign of support for all of you who have come together, whether in virtual or in physical mode at the Congress, and to also give expression to UNDP's very strong partnerships and the United Nations family to those who you bring together under the umbrella of Panorama. And certainly we will continue to be excited partners not least with um, the Pathfinder Awards that kind of give the world a window on the ingenuity of people working every day in the name of conservation of people and the future of the planet. So let me not take more time. Many more speakers are there. Just to say thank you very much and uh, very much looking forward to this partnership continuing. Back to you, Trevor. Thank you so much, uh, Akim. Um, and for the, the great support that UNDP is giving to the partnership. And now I would like to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Christian Paulus from the German Ministry, I should say the whole of it, right? Um, of, the, of, of environment, she is the Director General for Nature Conservation and Sustainable Use of Natural Resources. Perfect, perfect title, Dr. Paulus. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Trevor. We always meet again here in the context of Panorama and other issues. Uh, but first of all, Mr. Oberle, Mrs. Hofen, Mr. Steiner, ladies and gentlemen, also a very warm welcome from my side here to this event, natural, Naturally Beneficial Panorama Solutions. And I'm very pleased to be here today as uh, one of the supporters and financers of this program. But I'm also pleased, like I have to echo my colleagues to be here with you, with real pe people in a real space. I really felt like being dehydrated and only after one day I feel that I'm getting soaked and hydrated again and um, getting the inspiration I really need for our policy work in the ministry. Yeah, to round up the picture about uh, what all have been said here um, on Panorama already, I would like to, to, to give you an, an uh, overview on the strategies and on the policies that we are following from the Ministry for the Environment and why are we supporting um, Panorama for already such a long time. And um, I have to say it's a cornerstone of our um, ICI initiative that is the international, with full name, it's the International Climate and Biodiversity Initiative. I hope many of you know this finance program um, where we are since 2008 um, financing um, climate and biodiversity project in developing countries and in uh, emerging econom economies and already since that, so really 13 years, uh, the Panorama Initiative was part of the ICI program and this beautiful signing ceremony makes sure that it's going to, to last at least uh, that long or even more longer. Yeah, why is uh, Panorama such a, such a special animal and why is there such a long-standing support from the government? It's a platform we have already known, uh, heard, and I think we are going to, to learn much more in the uh, talks to come about how it is working for solution seekers and solution um, providers. 
And from the very beginning, the uh, different global uh, ICI projects uh, were integrated in the different panorama communities. So that is something that you really want to wanted to ensure from the very beginning that the knowledge that is uh, that is uh, created in our ICI project is not just uh, staying with the project or the region, but that it is shared um, and that the learning from successful approaches uh, at a global level becomes part of the transformative change that we all want and need. Yeah, and um, to um, Panorama is flexible. I want to mention that we uh, in the last year could add an additionally component, the so-called Panorama solutions for a healthy planet um, that um, is, is through a support project and uh, this includes development of sustainable business mo models, strengthening strategic partnership and policy uh, engagement in order to um, also have a response to the corona, to the corona pandemics. Yeah, um, but the panorama is also an integral part of our negotiations and our positions that we are having as a, as a federal government in the global biodiversity framework in the last 10 years and also in the years to come. We are at the moment in a crucial phase and an important phase. We had the last open-ended working group ending on Friday only. We really need to make progress and process, but um, it's our strong belief from the German side that we don't need only visions, ambitions and architecture of the framework, but we need implementation on the other hand. And um, implementation, <laughs> it cannot be said enough, is you don't um, is the is in the core of everything because uh, you ha you need to have nice goals and targets but what are the best targets without implementation and in that sense um, panorama has already played a crucial role in the last strategic plan of the last decade in the progress towards the IG targets and in the implementation of the sustainable development goals and when we think about the emerging global biodiversity framework um, it has uh, the pillar of capacity development, of knowledge generation, management and sharing, and of course of outreach, awareness, uptake and application. And this conference here is the best uh, proof that this is so much needed. Yeah, I think uh, in the beginning Panorama was small, it was a niche, but now it has really uh, become something um, that is seen as an institutional part of the, of the um, structure. And it has uh, demonstrated that it contributes to the development of the uh, and contributes to uh, the implementation interface because it brings together real people in real situations who have uh, um, developed real uh, solutions. And this cross-cutting um, aspect and um, the, the inspiration and uh, the engagement from, uh, of communities, um, different communities, is also a very important aspect. Um, so I cannot praise Panorama enough, you know, you realize that I'm really a fan of it. It's bottom-up learning, it's transparent, and it's... Um, it's really um, practical and inclusive. And with this uh, event and all the things that we are going to hear afterwards, I would really invite you to uh, join um, us in the Panorama platform to go through the website, visit it, uh, contribute to solutions, ask for solutions. And um, I'm very uh, convinced that uh, Panorama's outreach can uh, increase um, and help us in facing the challenges that we are having in front of us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Paulus. Um, couldn't have said it better. We, we <laughs> everybody was nodding. Great. So um, we're going to now move into other segments of the presentation tonight. So I'm going to ask Isa. To, sc to screen the uh, this introductory video, have we got sound and everything? Yeah. 
Panorama, Solutions for a Healthy Planet, is a partnership initiative which identifies and promotes examples of tested and replicable solutions, enabling their wider application by offering cross-sectoral global exchange opportunities. Panorama currently includes 948 solutions from 678 solution providers in 181 countries. How does Panorama work? Let's hear from the field. Our blue solution is Chimbay Island Coral Park in Zanzibar, Tanzania. Chimbay is located off the southwest coast of Zanzibar and is the first financially self-sustaining marine protected area in the world. We established more than 20 years ago um, with a very novel concept of developing ecotourism on the island as a not-for-profit business approach to generate all the financing necessary to run a marine protected area. Our Blue Solution is a climate change mitigation. And, uh, this is a community-based initiative in Kenya. Our main activity is uh, to conserve the mangrove ecosystem, which uh, has been integrated for quite a long period of time. Through the conserving, community can earn uh, incentive from this conservation that uh, they are doing. And uh, this has been one of the successful blue solution activities uh, or projects in Kenya. There are so many other countries that they want to replicate the same, and they refer Coco Pamoja as uh, their pilot project. Panorama mobilizes the involvement of an increasing number of organizations, at present including GIZ, IUCN, UNDP, UNEP, RARE, Grid Arendal, ICROM, ICOMOS, IFOM, Organics International, and the World Bank, in support of collating and analyzing solutions drawn from proven case studies. Panorama is organized into nine thematic communities, including ecosystem-based adaptation, agriculture and biodiversity, business engagement, nature culture, sustainable urban development and resilience, protected and conserved areas, marine and coastal, forest landscape restoration, and species conservation. Panorama contributes to achieving the Sustainable Development Goals, the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, and the Climate Change Adaptation and Mitigation Goals as defined under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Paris Agreement. Panorama welcomes new partners, thematic areas, and solutions. Join our community now. Great. So thank you very much. So what we're going to do now is clearly you've been given a, a little bit of an indication of the, the scope of the thematic uh, areas that Panorama is involved in. It's not only about conservation, it's also about other se sectoral development activities and what we can learn from them. But I think the other thing that we're, we're interested in is the learning process itself and the diversity of approaches that different learning communities apply. So it's a kind of a meta-learning platform. It's not only digital and online, but it's also in, present, in presence. So we have a, um, one of our great champions in UNDP is Midori Paxton. Uh, she was, uh, was in Malaysia somewhere that we came up with the idea of let's try and challenge people to bring solutions around sustainable financing together. But Midori has sent us a, a, a video that we're going to play uh, for this meeting. Good evening to all Congress participants and thank you so much for joining this Panorama session. My name is Midori Paxton. I'm heading the ecosystem and biodiversity work at the United Nations Development Programme. As jointly hosted by UNDP and IUCN and supported by several other partners, the Pathfinder Award celebrates, honors, and supports individuals, groups, or organizations for their tremendous contributions to the success of protected and conserved areas. Each award nomination is featured as a solution on the Panorama platform, providing a unique opportunity for practitioners to showcase their learnings and allow for successful practices to be scaled up globally. The first edition of the award was launched in 2018 with approximately 
200 nominations received from all over the world, focusing on innovations around protected area financing and resourcing. One of the special commendations from the award, I remember, went to Wildlife South Africa, who, along with the government of South Africa, introduced biodiversity tax incentives into the law as a financial benefit for landowners declaring protected areas on their land. Later this evening, you will hear from our 2018 winner, Miriam De Conning, Executive Director of the Prespa Orid Nature Trust, on the impact of the award and partnership with Panorama. As the gatherings of the three Rio conventions are set to be held through this year and next year, we recently launched the next Pathfinder Award. This award will feature multiple winning sites that successfully conserve nature while making tangible development gains related to human health, climate change mitigation and adaptation, or sustainable land management. We are currently reviewing nominations across all the categories and look forward to announcing the winners later this year. Lastly, I would like to thank our partners at IUCN and GIZ for our tremendous partnership and co-hosting this event with us. And I hope you will enjoy the rest of the session. Thank you. Thanks so much to Midori. So the Pathfinder Award was one way of actually getting out there and building the community and building the portfolio. But we also have another award format, which is known as the Blue Champions Award. And we have with us uh, Sri Lanka Seneviratne, Ratne, who will actually tell us about it herself in person. Yeah, that's great. Yes, hello everyone. My name is uh, Tilanka Sanimiratne. I'm part of the Blue Solutions Initiative and I'm happy to briefly present the Blue Champions Award. Um, so the Blue Champions Award is initiated by the Blue Solutions Initiative as part of the Panorama Partnership. And um, we coordinate the marine and coastal thematic community um, on the Panorama platform. And the initial idea of the Blue Champions Award is that we really had um, so many marine and coastal solutions on the platform and we wanted to put a spotlight on them and really highlight the knowledge that is already there um, and spread the awareness that um, the knowledge some practitioners might be seeking may already exist on our platform. Um, so, as you can also hear, the philosophy behind the Blue Champions Award is really similar um, to what Panorama embraces, and that is don't reinvent the wheel. Um, start to look at the knowledge that exists and value practitioners who do the work on the ground instead of always having to invent new solutions from scratch. So, how did we do that? Um, in spring 2021, we launched a campaign um, to seek practitioners who found solutions on the Panorama platform um, and were inspired by them and wanted to replicate them in their own context or practitioners who already have a solution at hand and want to upscale it into a bigger format. And this was done to a small grant mechanism. So um, the champions were supported not only technically but financially through the Blue Champions Award to, uh, um, yeah, to replicate the solution. Um, so the idea was really that they pick a solution from the Panorama platform or a building block, so a specific element of a solution, and are inspired by that and implement it in their own context and face their own challenges by learning from peers, learning from each other, um, and, li and listening um, yeah, to other people who might be facing similar challenges. Um, and we also had practitioners who yeah, wanted to upscale their own solution. So in the end, um, we had a vast number of applications and we selected five blue champions um, who, um, who then 
really showcased how they value the peer-to-peer -peer exchange, how they were inspired by other practitioners and wanted to implement it in their own context. And they also had a detailed implementation plan for six months on how they want to move forward with that. Um, so we have solution providers from beginning from um, Honduras to Costa Rica to uh, Tunisia to Kenya, um, that is a practitioner who is also there tonight, or the Oceans Alive Trust from Kenya is also here tonight. And last but not, not least, we have um, Balaji Vedarajan from the Omka Foundation, who will um, later on talk a little bit about his project. So thank you very much. Thank you, Lanka. So we've been talking about this in theory. So let's hear from some of these genius uh, inventors of solutions uh, in the field and we are really lucky here to have one of the winners of the first Pathfinder Award, Miriam Dakonik, who's going to tell us about her project and why it, why it should inspire you. So um, where's Miriam? Yeah. Oh, there you are. There you are, Miriam. Thanks, Trevor. Yeah, I'm very happy to be here this evening. My name is Miriam de Koning. I'm the executive director of the Presper Ochred Nature Trust, a transboundary conservation trust fund supporting financially implementation, implementation, implementation of conservation actions on, in the very important biodiversity hotspot, the Presper Ochred ecoregion at the boundaries of Greece, North Macedonia and Albania. In 2018, it was about sustainable financing, conservation trust fund. I thought, hmm, when I read it, interesting. And I've worked on solutions before, and I like to work on solutions of Panorama. So I thought, but it's too early. I was only two years there, and I thought, no, it's too early. Then somebody of my board asked, hmm, you should consider writing it. I said, hmm. Two weeks later, for me, it's very nice to have a solution to reflect on your work, to improve. And then two weeks later, uh, the inspiration came from the field. I was sitting with the park manager. And for me, a solution is not finished without a story. And he told the story, and that was the final piece. And I got it. And I wrote it up, and I was one of the first to su submit the solution. And I literally fell off my chair when I was announced as the winner. It came so unexpectedly. Yeah, what was very nice and the impact of the award, first of all, uh, PONT is uh, founded by the MAVA Foundation and supported by KFW on the behalf of the German government. And I really think they took the courage to set PONT up. And this acknowledgement was very, very important. But I'm a grassroots person. <laughs> so for me, it was also acknowledgement of the people on the ground working in the Presper Ochred eco region that really work there every day. And I'm looking at one of them. Albania, two months of working on fires. Everybody was on holidays, but they worked. And to give that recognition back to the field is extremely important. What I've managed so far is that we have the first snapshot solution from one of my grantees from Albania and somebody in North Macedonia is writing their solution. So that's also an upscaling in a sense. So that's very nice. After the award, which was in a big hall, Trevor, in Egypt, we like thousands of people, <laughs> which was, of course, absolute great visibility for Pont. We also had some interviews uh, through WildArc that was supporting it, and UNDP, IUCN, um, UNDP, IUCN and uh, WildArc were all put it in on their website, promoting Pond, which was really great. And in the end, that helped us to, some donors contacted us. And I hope at the end of this month um, that I will sign an agreement with the fourth donor coming out of that Pathfinder Award for future funding, a sustainable long-term financing for Pond, which helps us to geographically expand, double the area, and double the number of grantees. So thank you very much for that. And I hope I have been some bit of inspiration for people to go for this award. So it's worthwhile. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for the inspiring story. And it's, a, it, it's the proof that the ideas are out there, we just have to find them. 
and shine a spotlight on them and they will become real um, for others to be inspired. So that's, the, that's really the, the heartland of Panorama. And, and it's great to realize that all of those partners had to work together to make that possible. Um, it's the real evidence. So now I'm going to call on, on Balaji Pedarajan to, uh, are you there? Yeah, it's, he's the Blue Champion Award winner. So away you go. Good evening all, it's my privilege to be here. And I would like to talk about this, how the building blocks of uh, Panorama Solutions is really helps on the ground. We couldn't uh, imagine about how important uh, the building blocks. So we started to plant mangrove restoration in some in the southeast coast of India. Then we involved the fisherwomen, but there is a gap between planting mangroves and giving uh, support for the fisherwomen. We don't want to give any technology or training. Uh, so we decided to give goats to each family when the goats replicates to the new goat baby and it, give, it, it gives back to another family. So whenever the goat replicates, the new family receives the goats. So each family has to establish a mangrove nursery in the backyard. Then we went to the beach and we collected the waste fishing nets and cleaned them and used them as a fencing. So it helps to clean the coast and it gives the fencing to mangrove nursery. And now the goats are slowly replicating. It's, the numbers are increasing and the people are getting more goats. They want to grow the mangroves and the backyards. So this is how the project is expanding itself. So the goats, the mangroves and the waste nets are everywhere from Africa to Asia. So these concepts can be customized to other countries as well. I would like to thank Panorama Solutions for giving this opportunity. And Panorama actually helps us to bring our grassroots work into the international platform. So um, it's my privilege to be here and thank you very much. And your success also inspires us who work in the rare, rarefied atmosphere of CBD negotiations progress towards ambitious goals to actually know that some of these things are possible in the field. And so that's great. So um, now ISA's got a, a, another trick <laughs> up her sleeve, which is we'd like to get uh, to benefit from the accumulated expertise and diversity of your uh, experience as participants for the further development of Panorama. So, We've got a very, uh, uh, an audience poll where you need to just scan the QR code and fill in the form, which is, consists of five questions related to Panorama's strategic priorities. Since our whole world has become digital, this is it's kind of interesting, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it works. As long as it doesn't also charge your credit card while you're about it, right? <laughs> what happens next? This is five minutes and after you have the panel discussion. Can you see a result or not? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> The results are secret. <laughs> okay, so the team just wants to uh, get your, your thoughts. So if you haven't been able to do it, um, ISA will continue to go around. And uh, you can just scan that QR code, put in your, your answers, think about them, and submit. Okay, so... Um, I know it's, it's, always a, it's always a bad thing to get in the way of uh, a social event, but we're not finished yet. <laughs> we're still busy here. So we're going to move into a different session uh, now. Is it okay? We need to wait a little longer? Huh? Time. Time. In, in five minutes. In, oh, in five minutes. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. Sorry. Sorry.
So, so is the panel available when they come up here, or do they come up one yeah, at a time? Yeah, they come up one at a time. All of them? Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you don't have, so you don't have. Okay. And you'll organize the tour? Okay. Good. I'm just getting my instructions right from the boss. <laughs> So we're going to do, what we're going to do now is we're going to ask um, several panelists, if I can call them panelists, to come up. They represent uh, a, a panorama, in a way, of different perspectives. And as I sp said a little earlier, a diversity of approaches for recognizing solutions, exchanging knowledge, and scaling up good practices. So. Um, let me please invite Yuli Veltsin, the Head of Project Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services in Agrarian Landscapes at GIZ. Yuli? I'd also like to invite Russell Galt. Russell is the Head of the Urban Alliance at IUCN. And he's involved with the sustainable urban development and resilience component of Panorama. Then I would like to invite Eric Ross Salazar, the advisor, an advisor to Blue Solutions for marine and coastal biodiversity. This is part of the marine and coastal uh, thematic community, looking at uh, marine solution sourcing. I'd like to invite Luisa. Richter, junior advisor, mainstreaming ecosystem-based adaptation, strengthening in planning and decision-making processes. We know Luisa very well in our, our, our policy group, um, and she is involved with the EBA, the ecosystem-based adaptation thematic community, mainly focusing on the policy work. Then I'd like to invite my colleague, uh, Tim Badman, who's the director of IUCN's World Heritage Program. Um, and he has been one of the architects behind this fusion of nature-culture uh, ideology. We'll find you, oh, everyone chairs. Um, I'll move out of the way. And finally, I'd like to invite Cécile Fatibert. Uh, she's a solutions program officer in my program at IUCN. And she's going to hold the flag up for protected and conserved areas. Yay. <laughs> okay, so maybe we can, oh no, we can't move that. So there's space here too. Huh? We need another chair, right? Oh, we'll go down on the road. There's also one here. Are they fixed? Oh, they fixed? Oh, yeah. Here comes the chair. So, um, I'm not going to interfere, but I think it's a chance for all of you to uh, provide your inputs in a, in a way. Who's going? To? Huh? So, I'm going to start then perhaps with you, Julie. Figuring out the microphone. Yes, uh, is it working? No, yeah. Okay, um, good evening and glad to be here. And um, yes, I'm going to talk about a special, let's say, instrument that Panorama has been using and it's called the Right Chops. And we can see maybe here there is a sign, let's focus on what works. So this is kind of the mission of Panorama, but then there's always the challenge of um, we work very contextually and we work on the ground, but how do we present it to the larger community? And sometimes working well doesn't mean writing well or being used to the English language or whatever there is, or also technical problems that might arise if you want to write um, 
a solution for Panorama. So we have been creating uh, so-called ride shops where participants, and this also, which is very good, also works remotely on our preferred Zoom or Microsoft Teams or whatever it is. And uh, so there uh, you, ha you can create a vivid discussion and the feedback we're getting from the participants is actually that the exchange while you're discussing solutions that are to be written and how do you actually present them creates more solutions sometimes and creates the exchange that is needed in order to really um, think of what is the essence of what you are doing and how do you create a building block what is underlying that makes the solution work so you kind of reflect even what you have been doing together in a group and then are able enabled to present it and there's also then opportunity in hindsight after the right shops to contact each other and to see who pr who actually wrote up the solutions and how did it work so it's another kind of forum for exchange so yes thank you for listening thank you very much um yeah it's a pleasure to be here my name is russell gold i work for the iucn urban alliance and, and we're relatively new to the game uh, we've partnered with the world bank global platform on sustainable cities to mobilize solutions in the thematic community on sustainable urban development and resilience and i'm pleased to report that we already have i think over 150 solutions 164 but they're not all, our, all ours uh, many of them have been published firstly in other thematic communities and, and we've managed to to achieve that really in the last nine months and it's primarily through working with partners reaching out to iucn members and encouraging them to make use of panorama solutions to share their experiences to exchange lessons and ideas and practices with like-minded professionals. And that's been tremendously beneficial. Um, we also worked with a young researcher from the TU Dresden University, and she mapped our solutions against SDG 11 and found that actually Panorama Solutions Urban Portal has virtually a solution for every one of the SDG 11 targets. So we're really pleased about that as well. And we would encourage you to make good use of it um, we're, we're, we're growing, we're building, we're learning, but we have big plans. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon and thank you. Over at Blue Solutions, we were wondering how we could guarantee that the seekers could find that solution that was already on the platform and after working a lot with providers for many years, we, we started to think, why don't we identify our partners that need a solution and see how we can enable an exchange with them. And one of the first instances was with the secretary of the coordinating body of the Southeast Asian Seas, COPSI. And we had a very nice workshop on MSP with them. And one of the partner countries, Thailand, was starting an MSP project on Kosi Shang Island and they had a very direct need on stakeholder participation. They did not know how to engage the fishermen, how to engage the tourism sector or a very powerful sector of marine uh, navigation. And so we looked for solutions from the region that they could identify with culturally and we identified one in Vietnam that had worked with MPAs and the culture aspect in the communities near their MPA and another one in Indonesia that had used different assessment tools to develop MSP processes. And virtually, of course, due to the pandemic, we brought them together and did an exchange where they could learn from these two experiences, plus tools that Blue Solutions had developed on capacity building and on how to engage stakeholders, how to identify them, how to contact them, how to bring them on the table. And it was quite nice and the the Shang process is currently ongoing and they hope to finish it by the end of this year and it gave them a lot of good ideas on how to get what the communities needed and how to implement it. Another case was with Tun Mustafa Park and IUCN had been working with WWF Malaysia and with, uh, with a park administration because they want to be green listed. So one of the main problems they had is that currently industrial fisheries are included in the park so they were wondering how can we negotiate and work with industrial fisheries to try and move them away and gain support of artisanal fishermen because they were not sure we cannot be green listed if we had industrial fisheries and and solution was identified in mexico 
uh, the San Pedro Martir Biosphere Reserve. And they had a similar experience where when they created the area, they negotiated with industrial fisheries and they provided uh, other areas where they could fish and it was quite successful. So we brought them together again virtually and they had an interesting exchange that we hope will enable the green list in the future for Tun Mustafa. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Luise Richter um, and I'm the thematic community manager of the EBA thematic community. So it's a community that includes nature-based solutions on adaptation. Um, and we're doing all sorts of different activities as part um, of this thematic community. But one of the things that we have focused on a lot in the past is the lobbying and promotion of getting Panorama into policy documents, re uh, policy relevant documents and into policies themselves. And the reason the reason why we do so is because we are a knowledge management project, um, the global project Mainstreaming EBA that I work for, and in this role we always get asked about good examples um, from different sectoral contexts, from different regional contexts, and we really derive most of these examples from Panorama. And so we really think it's a great knowledge tool that you can use and we want this to be more known and to be more used around the world. And the main, main aspect of, of, of having this happen is to actually get it integrated into policies and to make policymakers aware of this too. Um, and one of the uh, main processes where we actually managed to do so was the integration of Panorama into the CBD voluntary guidelines for EBA and EcoDRR. I brought one sample with me, uh, not too many, but I also have a QR code if someone's interested in that for later on. Um, and we managed to get Panorama into it not only um, in multiple examples that are derived from the EBA thematic community, but also as a platform in, in its entirety. So it's recommended as a tool in there. We've done so um, in other contexts as well. Um, if you're interested in this, we can chat more about this later on, but I'm going to leave it here um, and pass this on to my colleagues. Thank you. So, uh, good evening. I'm Tim Badman, uh, Director of the World Heritage Program. I'm speaking uh, on behalf of Eugene Joe, uh, Maya Ishizawa, and Nicole Franceschini, who are the people that have coordinated the nature culture thematic community of Panorama, uh, which was launched just, uh, just under a year ago in October um, to bring together uh, examples of the way that culture in the sense of cultural heritage, traditional practices interweaves with the conservation of nature in, um, in so many different ways in, in different landscapes and provides some new and important ways of thinking about better results on the ground. I'll, I'll just mention three things I think that have been important about Panorama. The, the first is that you can generalize about nature and culture and the connections, but you can only make sense of the connections if you focus on the real, you know, the real relationships that can only happen at local level. So Panorama provides a tool to assemble a diversity of examples and ideas into one coherent place. Um, the second uh, re important relationship for us is that we've put Panorama into a strategic role in capacity development for World Heritage Sites and more broadly for both cultural and natural heritage site managers. Um, and it, it, this gives us a way to have a focus for people engaging in capacity building activities to document their experience and what they believe is working for them when they come to training uh, and capacity development courses and other, ex and other uh, opportunities to network so they can structure their thinking before they come and they can also help us build um, this uh, sort of platform, platform to share practice going forward. So there's a brilliant synergy between running capacity building events and creating a community of practice. And then the third um, area where we've been focusing with our culture sector partners, so this whole exercise is about bringing new partnerships into conservation, uh, IUC and connecting to the world of cultural heritage and, cult and uh, culture conservation and bringing uh, big networks that have hardly connected with nature conservation missions into our work. And we've been able to assemble a group of uh, cross-disciplinary um, reviewers to help us uh, quality control and uh, develop the, the, um, the, the, the network of examples and solutions in Panorama. And that's become a very rich way of exchanging on what we exchanging between, you could say, the, 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 uh, the, um, the governance that, that is trying to bring nature and culture together about what do we really mean when we say 
good, you know, practice could be better. So those are the three things I'd like to, to mention. And thanks, Trevor, and uh, the team for the opportunity to support uh, what is a, a really brilliant uh, uh, exercise. And we're just delighted with the results. Thank you. So hello, everyone. So I'm from the Protected and Conserved Areas uh, program uh, based in Switzerland with IUCN, and we co-manage the Protected and Conserved Areas thematic community with UNDP. And actually what we thought is um, each thematic community is a rich pool of solutions. For example, in the Protected and Conserved uh, Areas thematic community, we have about 464 published solutions so far. And we thought instead of um, taking them individually, what if we try to do some meta synthesis, some kind of analysis through them? So we, we developed a methodology. Uh, we partner with an uh, academic institution and to look through the trends. So what is, because if we have a collective, we, it's like collective knowledge and we can try to figure out what are common trends, what are, for example, for what do we need for uh, good governance, good management of protected and conserved areas. And it's also a way to point at what needs to be reinforced uh, through advocacy work uh, and also involving through s support to all stakeholders who are involved. So um, there's definitely room for more. That was an initial uh, uh, project that actually uh, Marie will talk more about uh, later. You will have the results of that, but um, I think there is really the, uh, more to do with this because it's really a rich, um, yeah, uh, uh, database uh, of of uh, solutions that can be really practical for uh, driving any development project, but also advocacy. So that's it for my side. Okay, so uh, thanks so much to the panel. Let's give them a round of applause for all their efforts. I think, I think you will discern that um, it's not only about situations and solution providers, it's also the way this program facilitates the interaction to generate the, uh, the ideas, to document them, and to cross-fertilize the learning between these different communities. So this is a very, very interesting learning concept uh, across a multiple dimensions of thinking and concern in this field. So, but I always, I think I always reserve my major interest for the, um, the real solution. I want to know the detail, like w what is this thing and why is it working? So we've had all the theory, we've got all the organization, we've got all the partnership, we've got all these, in the awards, all of this makes up panorama, but what truly makes up panorama is that person out there who is grappling with the situation that they're in and stumbles upon or is able to discover uh, what is actually working. So now, I don't have enough hands for these, all these devices, but um, right. We have the, the uh, privilege of having with us two uh, solution providers who are going to present their solutions. And so my first is to invite Mirella Gondek uh, from Brazil. You can tell us where this works, why is it important for you, and what, is your, what was your solution? So Mirella, please have the floor. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, on behalf of our mayor, Dr. Walter Suman, I would like to thank you all for the opportunity of being here tonight. It's a great honor and an amazing experience to share our work with the Panorama and the IUCN World Conservation Congress. I am Mirella Gondek, a biologist and environmental analyst, and I represent the Environment Secretary at the Prefecture of Guarujá, which is uh, the third largest island on the coast of Sao Paulo State in Brazil. Uh, the solution I present to you today is a result of the work developed by Clayton Jordão 
the Director of Research and Urban Environment. Uh, under the guidance of Sidney Aranha, our Environment Secretary, Ricardo Souza, our Deputy Secretary, um, together with the local communities, our technicians and partners. So the environment protected area of Serra do Guararu, uh, known in Portuguese as APA, Serra do Guararu, covers an area of more than 25 square kilometers, housing a significant fragment of Atlantic forest, including rainforests, mangroves, and other coastal ecosystems. Uh, it was created by a municipal decree in 2012 and is registered following the National System of Conservation Units, our Federal Protected Area Policy, under the Sustainable Use category. It's also listed by the Defense Council for the Historical, Archaeological, Artistic and Touristic Heritage in uh, 1992. So the main objectives uh, of the participative governance and good practices for the conservation of this environmental protected area are to protect Atlantic forest biodiversity, managing plant land use and tourism, and ensure sustainability of natural resources and heritage. Uh, it's then the combination of an integrated management council, which includes key actors such as local communities, government and partners, along with financial resources coming from different kinds of environment compensations. So the challenges we faced, uncontrolled tourism, real estate growth and illegal constructions. The establishment of criminal networks, illegal deforestation, predatory hunting and environmental deterioration. Uh, limited dialogue between local communities and the government, the need to raise awareness of the importance of natural, archaeological, cultural and historical heritage, and the urge to protect one of the last Atlantic forest fragments in good size and conservation condition. So for this solution we use two main building blocks. We created a management council in 2014 which is constituted by volunteers presenting uh, the diversity of actors and interests in the region, becoming an environment of trust between participants for consultation and deliberation of priorities, management and development of the territory, and also the sustainable financing. Uh, the maintenance and management resources come not only from the Municipal Environmental Fund, but from partnerships with the private sector, state and federal environment conduct adjustment terms and various environmental compensations. As a result, we now have um, systematic, is the next one. <laughs> we have the systematic monthly meetings of the management council that has fostered a shared feeling of the need of responsibility for the conservation of the natural heritage and its importance for well-being and sustainable development. Yeah, I'll change for the next one. Yeah. Uh, the elaboration of the APA's management plan in 2017, uh, we have created a group for the inspection campaigns and custodianship of the territory with joint efforts of the local communities and also uh, development of projects and research in collaboration with universities and environmental institutions, all guided by the APAS management plan. So this success has enabled us to create a second municipal protected area, the APA Serra do Santo Amaro, which is now covering 50% uh, of our territory and creating an urban ecological corridor, one of the largest ones in the region. And that's it. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> And thank you very much, Mirella. Um, great, great example. And now I'd like to uh, call upon Des Bowden to tell us about a solution from the North Kenya coast. Des. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very nice to be here. Um, we're going to just start today with a, a short film, a very short film. I know uh, it's late and everyone must be getting tired, but we'll start with the short film and then we'll go into a, a, a very quick talk after that.
village is like many other villages in Kenya. We live from what we catch. If we don't catch, our children go hungry. I'm just like other fishermen, like my father, my grandfather. Imagine my life will be the same as theirs. We only wanted what our fathers had. That was our vision then. We started to see the, the decline of the, the sea catch and the big fish were not there anymore and there are more fishermen chasing fewer smaller fish. Fishing was not making enough for us to live on. We had to think about how we can do about it. We talked a lot, but we knew that we have to act if any was going to change. So in this journey, we formed the Kurito Conservation and Water Association, an organization that is bigger than any one of us. KSBA United to protect and restore the promise of the sea and the, the things can go better than how they were because the things were going so worse. We created a marine protected area. This is the heart of our project from where everything else has grown. These marine protected areas, MPS, are very important as nurseries and sanctuaries for the fish to grow. It's amazing to see how good nature recovers if left alone. We started to see fish running to the area and evidence of breeding, even after the MPA fishing catches improved. Our first objective, restoring our area, was nearly complete. Little by little, we realized we have done a great thing. Other people from all over started to ask us about the project, how they could achieve the same successes. We have had visitors from all over to see our MPA. Other fishermen came to us and learned how we started. We can see our input being rewarded. Today, we have over 20 people employed by Kesia Bay. Fishing in the area is good. Tourists bring us funds too. We have a volunteer program which brings people from all over the world to learn from our example. We need to balance the needs of the community with the environment. We have set up business in honey, furniture, tailoring. We have achieved many things. Our beautiful, healthy MPS tells the best story of our success. None of us would imagine this thing will happen in our lives. Looking forward, we feel our children will have a safer and more hopeful future. We, the KCWA, is proof that working together with a common goal can achieve the impossible. Um, okay, um, t tonight um, we're here, um, I'm here to represent two organizations. One is the Kuruwita Conservation and Welfare Association, which started in 2003. Um, it was started due to an environmental crisis um, whereby fishermen and were, were losing their livelihoods um, and um, they, they were re really struggling. So they, we all got together as residents of the area and we started the Kuruwita Conservation and Welfare Association. Um, 
From there, we uh, developed a marine protected area um, uh, under the four pillars, uh, economics, governance, and social, and environment. And we um, continued to um, do peer-to-peer -peer training with other communities, other, other uh, communities along the coast, and have become an example to other people along the coast um, in, in marine resource management. Uh, the other organization is Oceans Alive, which is a, um, a bigger organization. Sorry, the slides are not going in, in the sequence that they're supposed to be going. Um, but we started Oceans Alive, which is a much bigger organization working in co-management, uh, co-management of marine resources, building on the success that we've had in Kuruitu and um, starting a co-management process, the first of which we've started uh, very recently um, with uh, over... 120, 000, uh, 120 square kilometers of protected uh, area. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to just hand over uh, to my team as well to um, come and discuss and help um, uh, further uh, what, what our achievements have been. All right. Thank you so much. My name is Amasi Mbogo from Oceans Alive Trust. So building on the building blocks from KCWA, which was founded in 2003 as a community organization, which started the Tengefu, which is the LMA model in our local perspective. It's a community-driven process. Um, by the 20, year 20, 20, 2006, we had the first LMA in the Western Indian Ocean. And that actually influenced the policy framework in Kenya because the KCWA started the LMMA uh, solution even before the government of Kenya had set up uh, a community management system. So this has actually influenced the policy framework and now we have the BMUs who are managing the fishery resources. And in 2005, um, the LMMA... Uh, movement or the Tengefu approach, the model, people are coming to learn and they replicated it along the coast region of Kenya, but also in the Wyo region. And as of now, the, the role of Oceans Alive Trust basically is to build the capacity of the KCWA, because this is a local community in, in initiative, and now the Kuruitu Beach Management Unit. So you realize that the KCWA started, but later on, after the 2007 BMU regulation was set up, now the BMUs came on board. And from that time now, we have been building the capacity of these two community organizations to really strengthen the internal capacity to manage the fisheries resources. And in this year, 2021, uh, Oceans Alive, in collaboration with the Fisheries Department, the KCWA and the Kuruit Beach Management Unit, have piloted a coin management uh, plan, which is going to give and to guide the governance and management of the resources along the 12,000 hectares within the Kuruit area. And the beauty about this, the Kenya government has set um, the co-management regulation, they've revised co-management regulations as of 2020. So this co-management plan is going to be the first one in the entire Kenya to be piloted. And so, therefore, we are setting the stage for the rest of the BMUs to really follow and to really see how does it work. And as of now, we are actually... Um, um, promoting a, a community-driven governance system owned by the community in a participatory approach because you realize that the fisher communities are the grassroots organization. They are the owners of the resource. And therefore, they have to have that ownership. So we are building their capacity to be able to manage. And therefore, we see this as... Um, as a way, as a solution to effective management of the resources. So the Tengefu model is really a learning, an indigenous traditional learning, you know, living classroom for the communities to learn and others to learn. And even now the, part, the partners, 
is one of the key solutions that if it is replicated globally, there are going to be change in the management of our resources and more importantly, to enhance sustainability. And so the peer-to-peer -peer learning, really, it's really a powerful tool which falls within the panorama solution and as one of the key building blocks. And what we have been able to realize since the establishment of the Tengefu, Tengefu is a local language in our local perspective of an LMMA. There's been at least 400% plus increase in fish biomass. And what you've seen in the video, initially before the Tengef, there was nothing. The place was greatly degraded and there was nothing that could see. But now we have a story to tell. At least 30% of coral recovery, we've been able to see at least 70% of seagrass recovery. And these figures that you're sharing here, they were taken like five years ago. So we still have to do further monitoring and evaluation. So there's really a really improvement. Community life will have improved because of the increased fish cash out of the spillover from the Tengefu. And so that translates to improved uh, food security. This has also been replicated to other communities. And again, it has set a, set a stage for research validation and it has informed a uh, policy framework. That has also, even the CMA new, the CMA guidelines that have been revised by the Kenya government, they have borrowed a leaf of the change that we've been able to see. And we are happy to, to, to state that uh, this Tengefu model also won the UNDP Equator Award Prize in 2017. So with that few remarks, I would like to see my colleague Ledama to finish on that presentation. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Mercy. So following the success seen by the Tengafu model, not only to the environment, but also with other communities from different regions in Kenya, but also um, in the East African region from Eritrea to Djibouti, coming to visit this living classroom and learn from that, we could only be motivated and inspired to ask the question, what if other communities also had access to this solution? What if our community of fisheries had access to other traditional innovative solutions. And with that, you come to realize there is a, there is a gap, you know, because if that was the case, think of how powerful that would be. Think of the solutions that would be traded, not only between communities, but even to private institutions, even insp um, uh, inspiring the policies that are made. And so with that is also where we look to panorama and you know, we're motivated by the work that they're doing by bringing solutions from different areas in the world onto one platform to, to be shared and, you know, to inspire other solutions. And there are many solutions on Panorama which are in line with ours and which we hope we inspire in different areas of the world and it, which we've also, you know, taken some inspiration from but also some support. And it is through this Panorama platform that we've also gained other kinds of support, such as through Blue Solutions, who are now supporting one of our internal capacity building initiatives for the Beach Management Unit, which is the Fishers Community Association and you know, Fishers Community Organizations. And with that, we're now looking to drive that further. You know? And Ocean's Alive, in believing in networks, especially at the community level, are initiating and are starting, you know, to push for that at the Khalifi region. And so with that being said, we're not only looking for communities from different um, regions in Eastern Africa, we're also looking at um, policy, um, policy level institutions. We're looking at private institutions because what's more needed than, you know, a solution at the right place is for that solution to be put into action. And for that to come to action, we need all the right stakeholders. And that is what we're trying to do um, where we are. And through this, you can really not only drive these solutions coming down, but you can really put them into action, which is what is needed. And so through this, uh, sorry, if you can go back. 
yeah, through this, um, we are looking to move forward. And that is where we are also calling on more partners and also more support um, from all sectors to come and help drive this forward with us and come and also visit our lovely inspiration living classroom of Kuritu. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm sure you agree that when you start digging into it, that's when the real richness comes out and then you think, I, I can relate to that. That's a great idea. So thanks, Des, and the whole team. And the, the video was a great communication me medium. And I'm hoping that as we, the platform develops, these kind of communication tools of getting the message out will also develop um, very, very nice, you know. Um, really inspiring. So now we're going to go to the last segment, right? I think I'm getting, I'm getting that right. And uh, it's a really short segment, but a, 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 a good, it's a good time. Um, you heard a little bit earlier about the analytical approach that we really also need to look across solutions, look at commonalities, look at um, what kinds of building blocks predict what kinds of outcomes. And so that process has just started with Panorama involving different academic institutions and we're really really interested in moving Panorama that way so that it's not only and it's not only capturing and interpreting and interpolating uh, information it's also being able to be predictive and reaching out and uh, scaling up and inspiring new action and new combinations um, we heard earlier about the Sustainable Development Goals. So Marie Fishborn, who's one of the uh, really important members of the team and the Secretariat together with uh, Rosemary uh, Metz. Um, Rosemary's being very quiet in the session, but she's a, a powerful force in Panorama. They've been working together on the Secretariat, and uh, Marie has also been working on this project for a couple of years now to pull out all of these uh, analytical solutions. So I'm going to give you the floor, Marie. I've been involved in the project, but it's really, it's your night. This is, this is for you. Thank you, Trevor. Yeah. Give us just a second. No, that's, no, it's not working. It's okay. Uh, it on and it's not, it's, uh, no, it's on. It's, uh, Can we uh, extend the screen? No? Okay. Then we shouldn't then. Okay, no problem. Can we? Yeah, so back to the beginning now. Is it up now? Okay, so it's my great pleasure to launch this publication uh, today and uh, present results of about two years of work. This is uh, one of the first efforts of actually looking across the portfolio of Panorama Solutions and trying to draw out common trends and messages. And the title of the publication is Solutions for Development Challenges insights from protected and conserved areas. So I won't go into a lot of detail on the findings, obviously, it's, as it's um, the end of the day and this is the last thing standing between us and the catering. Please do stay on and join us for drinks. But I just want to share some, some key points. So what were the objectives? Why did we embark on this effort? Well, um, as you probably all know, conservation of biodiversity of species, ecosystems, and also genetic diversity is the primary objective of protected and conserved areas. And I'm just going to refer to protected areas from here on, uh, just for practical reasons. That's what they are set up for. But additionally, uh, these sites can provide very important benefits to humans through maintaining functioning ecosystems. So what is often called ecosystem services. The Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, that were um, agreed on in 2015 under the UN are a driving force 
behind global efforts for sustainable development and conservation in this decade up until 2030. And they also provided a very useful framework for us to, to look at the solutions and um, uh, look at exactly this question of what these solutions tell us in terms of how protected areas can contribute to a wider sustainable development beyond their conservation outcomes. So we looked across the portfolio to identify common trends and this was an important effort also for Panorama as uh, Trevor just uh, mentioned and Cecile earlier as well because it was really a pilot effort in terms of, of doing this sort of a metasynthesis, so uh, not just taking the solutions as individual examples. And this is really an expansion area for Panorama as a whole. So uh, the work that has gone into this publication uh, was also a useful effort in terms of developing a, a first methodology that we can now apply um, to other questions and, and across the thematic communities. A few words on the methodology. So we looked at a total of uh, 106 solutions relating to protected areas from Panorama. A first step was to understand and define which societal benefits are most relevant to the objective of the publication. So that translates into which SDGs are most relevant and are of particular interest uh, in terms of, uh, of this, this question of how protected areas provide wider societal benefits. And we did a literature review to come up with the answer uh, to that. And the result was that we uh, selected these eight SDGs to focus on. In a second step, we then um, identified the solutions that are most relevant to the topic. Uh, of the publication and came up with a short list. So we excluded solutions where the primary objective and, and uh, the main impacts really relate specifically to biodiversity conservation, so to, to, to species conservation action, for example, uh, and that have less of a focus in terms of uh, wider benefits for, for humans. In a third step, we then uh, assigned uh, each solution to an SDG that was uh, to one SDG that is most central in terms of the outcomes of that solution, the impacts, and so created clusters. Uh, so there were X number of solutions in cluster uh, in the cluster for SDG one on no poverty and uh, another set of solutions in the cluster for SDG, SDG two, etc. This was done by at least two people for each solution to avoid any bias. And of course, each solution usually contributes to multiple of the SDGs. For the overarching synthesis, where we looked at the whole set of 106 solutions, we did include all SDG contributions of all solutions. But for the synthesis within each cluster, so let's say for the cluster on SDG 1, we looked only at the solutions that had that SDG really at the core of the impact. And uh, when we did that, we didn't just take the headline, so the, sh the short title that you have in the icons, no poverty, etc. We really looked at the uh, uh, full scope and intention behind each of the SDGs, which is captured in the targets. And finally, we did the actual synthesis work. So we summarized insights from the solutions per SDG and also across uh, looking at um, aspects that describe the context, uh, so for example, the, the ecosystem or underlying challenges that the solution addressed. We looked at the process uh, of the solution, so this is about the building blocks mainly that you heard about in this event. And finally, we looked at impacts, for example, in terms of um, beneficiaries. Now, on to some of the key findings. Maybe the most important message is that protected and conserved areas are already relevant to all of the SDGs. They contribute to every single one of the 17 SDGs. Uh, so this graph shows you the number of solutions that contribute to each of these goals. And obviously uh, some are much more relevant than others, but protected areas make a contribution across all of them. And this is a point that IUCN has been highlighting for a long time. And the insights from these case studies really underline that. Now to which 
SDGs do they contribute the most? So unsurprisingly, SDG 15 on life on land and SDG 14 on life below water feature most prominently because the primary ob objective of protected areas is exactly to preserve life on land and below water. So all of this, uh, the solutions by default contribute to uh, at least one of these two uh, biodiversity SDGs. SDG 13 on climate is also very important, highlighting uh, the important role of protected areas in uh, mitigation and adaptation. And then perhaps uh, a bit more uh, surprising is that SDG 17 on partnerships is also very important, is also one of the front runners. So this SDG is sometimes perceived as a bit of a, a rag bag of many different objectives around financing, trade, capacity development, etc. But what we really looked at here is, is um, how protected area man management processes uh, are enablers or make, make these sites enablers of multi-stakeholder partnerships. And they can really foster collaboration um, and, uh, and, uh, and development of partnerships across sectors at site level, focusing on shared interests that different actors have in a site, for example, tourism operators, uh, academia, even schools, etc. SDG 8 on employment also came out very strongly with about half of the uh, 106 solutions uh, centrally contributing to that one. Mainly the solutions in this cluster describe uh, successful ecotourism approaches. So ecotourism uh, can be a very important driver of local development, but it also creates incentives for preserving the site values because uh, that's what, what visitors are most interested in and, and what they come for. And closely linked to that is SDG 1 on uh, poverty. Uh, so. Um, uh, Alleviation of poverty through protected areas is often related to employment. And uh, the relation between protected areas and poverty is, has been uh, the subject of much debate, but in the best of cases, and this really comes out in the solutions as well, um, they can contribute to, to social issues such as poverty uh, in addition to their conservation contributions. An overarching observation is that Many of the solutions illustrate that success was achieved by uh, careful engagement of a broad group of people over an extended period of time. And that getting conservation right uh, means getting contextual governance and social and economic issues right. The two are inextricably linked. And to close, some conclusions uh, that we can draw from, from these results is um, while the relationships between the SDGs is not always very straightforward, so for example, there are many tensions between the so-called environmental and the social goals, and there's often a need to negotiate trade-offs between the two, um, there is really uh, a lot of potential in a, in a coordinated response, or in the, uh, in the case of protected areas, a coordinated management approach, which is an opportunity to address multiple of the SDGs. So an example, um, again, that's something that, that many of the solutions focus on is uh, conservation of mangroves. Uh, so they're obviously very important in terms of their biodiversity value. Uh, so that touches on both SDG 14 and 15 as they're at the interface between the land and the water. But they also make a very important contribution to, uh, to climate change mitigation and adaptation by protecting against st uh, storm surges, etc. So uh, there's a link to SDG 13 on climate action. And finally, um, uh, there are important uh, nurseries for, for fish. Uh, so by preserving mangroves, that's a contribution to sustaining fish stocks, which in turn are important for, um, for food security uh, covered under SDG 2. Our results also underline uh, the relevance of protected areas for meeting societal needs, and, and this provides additional arguments for further strengthening them uh, as part of development strategies at national and at global level. And um, 
Uh, one point uh, related to this uh, is that the, um, the IUCN Green List of Protected and Conserved Areas standard, which is our standard for assessing performance at site level, really recognizes the importance of good governance and puts that as an integral component of assessing a site's performance through, um, through some of the criteria of the standard. In closing, I'd like to thank a number of people. This was, of course, a team effort with about 30 contributors. We had an academic partner, the uh, Graduate Institute in Geneva. Uh, we've also worked with uh, the IUCN World Commission on Protected Areas uh, on a number of the um, thematic chapters. Uh, several colleagues from the IUCN Secretariat, as well as Panorama Partners, contributed to this. And, a special thank you also to the two, or two peer reviewers who really contributed to the quality of the publication. And Miriam is here and has uh, spoken earlier today. Uh, the publication has been made possible with funding from the BMU as our main development partner for Panorama as a whole. And in particular through um, the Panorama support project as well as the uh, Blue Solutions project. It's available as a free download on the IUCN website. And if you'd like to know more, you can, of course, get in touch with uh, Trevor and myself uh, as the editors. And with this, I'm handing back to Trevor to guide us to the cocktails. Thanks, Marie, and uh, congratulations on the team for bringing that publication through. That's going to be very important, and I think we want to see more of that. So, well done. It's really great. And. I don't have a long thank you list because I think this event has, has shown you what's involved in Panorama. It's a, it's a kind of an even-handed partnership. The Director General asked me, how, how do you decide you know, who does what in this complementary partnership? And I said, well, we figure it out because it is a partnership. And there's strategy development, there's business development, there's technical development, there's you know, there's a steering committee, there's, uh, you know, th there's a policy uh, working group, which I've been working on. So I know how different hands get to work in different ways to make this all happen. And that, I think, is really the power of a partnership. So I keep looking at, at Rosemary because Rosemary is a, a driving force and a real great supporter of Panorama. So you didn't speak tonight. So I wanted to thank Rosemary in particular for your very careful and dedicated uh, 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 involvement. Yeah. And then, and, and Sorry to jump in, but uh, those of you who are closely involved with the Panorama Partnership would know that Rosemary is unfortunately leaving us, headed to Madagascar. So I just also want to take the opportunity to thank her for her incredible contributions to the partnership and wish you farewell. <laughs> We're not quite letting you go yet, but this might be the last time we meet you in person with your panorama hat on. So I, I, I want to just, uh, if you go away with the message that panorama is a partnership and that that partnership depends on mutual supportive relationships to do something powerful in the world. And what we've seen, it, as, you, as we heard earlier, scaled up from small beginnings. What we want to see it become is a is a real surge uh, with a critical mass that you can actually go in and analyze and figure out some of the most important questions of our time. We are committed in IUCN to doing that. And we've, we've heard this evening from all of our other different partners and the people representing them how, how that's catching on. And it's, it's, it's a kind of a, I don't know what it is. It's, that, it's a critical mass issue and it, it works. And we're looking forward to a surge of solutions coming to us from Madagascar, which I'm absolutely sure we're going to see. So maybe uh, I know it's been a, lo a long event, and I thank you all as for being with us and sharing in, in this. It's a justification for us uh, being here to have such sub substance, such content, and such a legacy. And so I'm not sure how they're organizing it, but we now have a uh, cocktail uh, available. And you're all welcome to meet one another, to ask your questions and to come up with some inspiring new solutions uh, that we never thought of before. So thanks again and thank you everybody.
And I should say thanks to ISA in particular for the event organization and also the technicians for a great day. Merci beaucoup tout le monde. Muchas gracias.